there can be no health without mental health. Now in the midst of the pandemic, I learned a word from a friend in the World Health. He said, this, besides the COVID-19 pandemic, there's also a pandemic of fear. Yeah. So if you have two pandemics running together, pari pasu, it's called a syndemic. This is Masterminds, where we talk with leaders from many industries on how mental health and stress have impacted their lives. Many people believe that good health is centered on the body and suffer silently from poor mental health, anything from anxiety to depression to chronic work stress. Only a select few know that the core of good leadership and healthy living lies in the mastery of our minds. In this podcast, host Bjorn Lee and his guests share their stories of fighting stress and achieving mental resilience. The goal? To encourage others to do the same. Here's Bjorn. Welcome back to another episode of the Masterminds podcast. Today's guest is Professor Kwa Yi Hyuk. Professor Kwa is an esteemed psychiatrist who has received training at Oxford Universities. So, Prof Kwa, thank you for joining the show. You were trained in psychiatry at Oxford and Harvard Universities. How did that prepare you for the, uh, the treatment of mental health in Asia? What did you discover when you came back to Asia? Well, first, thank you, Bjorn, for inviting me to this program. And I am delighted to join the rest of your your esteemed speakers. Well, how does the training in, in the West benefit my practice here in Singapore? We have to modify, obviously, you know, because the psychiatry in England and psychiatry in America is slightly different from what we have here. And psychiatry is very culture and language related. But studying in Oxford uh, gives you a, a good perspective how psychiatry develop and give you skills. I think the main thing is learning skills like psychotherapy and, that, and that also an appreciation of research. Similarly, in, in, in Harvard, uh, the skills that I, I learned from some of the senior professors and also some of the research skills that was very, very important. But not to bring everything lock, stock and barrel to, to practice in Singapore because it's so, so different, you know. So we have to adapt it to the modified. For example, in psychotherapy, you know, uh, the traditional uh, Freudian psychotherapy that was trained in psychoanalysis in, in, in the UK may not be very appropriate here in Singapore because it, it sometimes takes one and a half hours, you know, and the, the clinics here are so uh, packed with, with patients, it probably just about half an hour for a patient. And so what we do is to modify it. We call it brief, integrative, personal therapy. Because many of our patients here in Singapore, uh, before they leave the room, they will ask you, doctor, what can I eat, what I can't eat? Something which I don't encounter when I was working in England and America. No one asks about food. Here they ask you. Because to, to the Chinese, to the Malays, Indians, food and the diet has relationship to your physical and mental health. So that's very important for us to remember. That's very insightful. That's very insightful indeed. I also read uh, one of the many interviews that you have conducted uh, over the years. There's one particular one that stood out for me. It mentioned that, and I quote from the article, that they said that you have spent your entire career on fighting against the stigma of mental illnesses in Singapore. I'm sure it's not just Singapore, but broadly across the whole Asia region as well, there has this social stigma against mental health, right? You are right, Beyond, I think very right. Uh, um, when I first came to work here um, in uh, 1981 in January, um, I remember the first day that I, I worked in, in uh, the mental hospital called Woodbridge Hospital. It's a typical mental asylum, you know. And the evening when I went back home, I, uh, my neighbor at the time was a, a doctor from Tan Tok Seng, and he asked me, where are you working now? I said, well, I'm working in Woodbridge. And he started to laugh. To, to him, mental health psychiatry, to him, is, is something very, very comical, you know. You know? It, it's uh, it, it's yeah, it's a sad. joke to him. You know? yeah, sad. It's, it's right. And suddenly, you don't understand, you know. People suffer, you know, people are, are going to difficult times. You know? And the people who work in the hospital are also tainted by the stigma, right? So I felt that there's a lot of misconception. 
about mental Ill illness. You know? And so and it, it, it affects care of a patient because even when they are well and when they, they go out to work, they are often stigmatized. People ask you, have you had a past illness? You say, well, I used to depression, then I won't give you. I would even sign up for insurance, you know, one time, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and it's, it's very difficult to track young doctors or nurses to work in the mental health facilities because of the stigma, all right? And so one of the ways I, I find it's important is first, you have to wean the people within your own professional group, the doctors. And um, the university department was then in, in the Singapore General Hospital. So I thought the first thing is to win the... Um, this, this confidence of my colleagues in medicine and surgery. So working closely to them, very, very important. And, and one of the big studies we did in the Singapore General Hospital, that was of great relevance to the world, was a um, study on alcoholism. The Singapore study found that about 68% of people after one year recover, compared to the English study. The study in England found that 50% recover. One of the good reasons is because almost all the patients I look after in, in Singapore, they go back and look after by their family members. In England, those who drink problems, often they are sent back, they stay in the hostel. Because the, it, and it, the, the English custom or the British custom that someone is above 18 or 20, they, they don't stay with their family anymore. And yeah. sometimes they drift down, I was working in Oxford area, the people from Scotland, the Scottish patients drift down to Oxford area. And so they have very poor family support. You know? Mm. So the Singapore site, a good family support um, with a regular care outcome was much better. So this is very important to say, hey, something is different. The result is a bit different from, from Singapore than compared to the West. I was invited to give a lecture in the Royal College meeting in London. And it's wonderful. They say, hey, the management is different. You know, uh, um, the family plays a very big role now. And, and also together with uh, family support, we talk to them about diet, exercise, which some of the things we often don't talk about in, you know, in the West. So the Singapore study is, is more holistic in a way, talk about diet, exercise, family support, all together. So it, it tells you something about, uh, about uh, how to take care of people with mental health problems. So slowly we begin to develop our, our program. Yeah, definitely. You have definitely come a very long way in uh, fighting this stigma, and I think we all applaud and salute you for this effort because it's a very, very important issue in Asia. So thank you for spending uh, you know, uh, over 40 years, I think, uh, to fight this stigma. And uh, we definitely want to be a part of it as well. What you just said is actually really interesting. I think uh, one of your latest projects is the Mind Science Center, right? I think one of the new centers of excellence under the National University of Singapore and US. And uh, what you just said about how the Mind Science Center promotes innovative non-drug uh, interventions is uh, really interesting because you come from a psychiatry background, right? And uh, what we, what the general layperson on the street is, uh, the understands of psychiatry is that you use drugs to solve the problems. But here you are advocating for non-drug solutions. So what are some innovative uh, solutions and strategies are you thinking of doing uh, at the Mind Science Center? So um, the Mind Science Center, Amazing, uh, beyond this, it's not the idea of the psychiatrist, you know, because a non psychiatrist thought about it, and his, and his name is uh, Mr. Wee Sinto, the late Mr. Wee Sinto. Yes, yes. So he told me that cannot, you cannot all focus all the time on medication, uh, um, uh, you know, drug treatment. There are different approaches. So we, we thought about that, you know. But we, when we were discussing that, I was invited to give a lecture in, in Boston, in the uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, part of the Harvard Hospital, uh, teaching hospital. And I was telling them that it is possible uh, for us to think of ways to prevent dementia. So I, I told my colleagues, um, Professor Goligan, and also Wisinto, that if we can have a, a, a program that we can, anyone comes in with poor memory, we, we stabilize the high blood pressure, the diabetes, talk about diet, exercise, uh, and Mr. Wee is very keen on mindfulness. Mindfulness is a way of helping the concentration, uh, uh, focus the mind, you know, and also uh, if, if we have art therapy, 
And so all this together became part of what they call Dementia Prevention Program, which is now uh, uh, in a community, it's called Age Well Everyday Program. Age Well uh, Program. Unfortunately, dementia is still a, a stigma, the word dementia itself. Yes, that's so another we kind thought, of Yeah, we'll turn it around because something more positive. So everyone agreed to it. So we tell, tell people age well every day. Right. Well so, every day. So, yeah. so with that moving well, and we, so beginning when we first started, well, some people say, well, we agree there's something on, uh, on uh, art uh, or music. But this thing of mindfulness, is, is it a, a, a Buddhist ritual? You know, where is the evidence? You know? Most of the data come from North America. You know, and, and most of the researchers you know, said, what about Asia itself? You know? So we started the randomized control study at Jurong Point. Jurong Point is wonderful because um, the space there is given to us by the owner of Jurong Point, the Lee Kim Ta family. And it's the first time in Asia that a research team is anchored in a shopping mall. You know? Yeah. Uh, elderly people come to see me, my clinic at NUH or in the Ferrer Park Hospital. I mean, the, the cost is quite high, but the Jurong Point is free. Wow. And uh, in the space, we even renovated the space, it cost them about $300,000, you know, and it's wonderful. They're very generous family. Small you know, donation. Yeah. Family. You know. And um, so a lot of, so we, we screen about 50, 50 blocks of flats around the Jurong Point area. Um, our nurses will knock the door of every flat. Anyone above 60 years old, we asked, invite them to the Jurong Point for a very thorough mental health assessment, mm -hmm. physical health, mental health, and also for those whom we, are, we think were very early or uh, propensity towards dementia, we also did brain scan and all the, uh, the blood tests. And so from there, we, we did a randomized control study comparing uh, health education and mindfulness uh, uh, practice. Right. And it's amazing the result we published uh, uh, this morning. Another paper we published, uh, and they found that uh, not only is there an increase in, in brain activities, the, they call it brain nodal activities, but also it corresponded well with good memory and also mood changes. So, it, so the mindfulness practice is not only good for, in terms of memory, concentration, but also in mood, in, in uh, um, lowering the anxiety and improving those people with depression. So those are a very very strong evidence and published in international journals and uh, uh, high impact factor that yes. the scientists are now uh, uh, yeah. very excited about here in Singapore and also around the world. Yeah, in that's fact, very we, good. Yeah. we presented data at the, uh, the World Congress of Psychiatry. Yeah, that's very good to hear. Maybe we can uh, dive a little bit into the uh, personal life uh, of yourself, Prof. Um, can you, if you don't mind sharing, can you um, help our audience understand maybe a personal anecdote? What was one of the most stressful episodes of your life? And what did you do to recover? One of the most stressful episodes of my life. Well, um, something to inspire you know, like by sharing something. When you are, yes, when you're very young, um, you never th thought of death, you know. Uh, and, and then when I look back now, um, after I graduate, graduated as a young doctor and finished my housemanship, um, the Vietnam War had just ended. You know, yeah? mm. And uh, the most powerful nation in the world, America, has lost to a third world country, mm. Vietnam. And they left behind a huge arsenal of weapons. You know, the thoughts of um, tons of weapons and, and, and all kind of howitzers down there. And at that time, the, the, the communist guerrillas in, in, in Malaysia, they managed to bring some of the weapons down to Malaysia. You know, and they were all fighting the, the, the jungles in Malaysia. And because the army, uh, I was still a young doctor, I was conscripted. You know, and after training, I was made a captain. You know, I was told to move up with the troops who were engaging the communist guerrillas in the jungles in Malaysia. You fought in and that war. Were you involved in the war effort? Real war. So you, you go inside there, the, wow. the jungle, Yes, people were shot dead, killing the howitzers, they were firing away. And well, strangely enough, at that time, I, I thought a bit about it. It didn't cross my mind, but obviously, my mother was very, very anxious, very, very worried, you know. Yeah. Um, but it, in a way, 
it is still your 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 mind, the mental resilience. It, you become very very strong uh, mentally. You know? Of course, you see death, you know, killings and all that, you know. And after that, I, I, when I finish off in my 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 uh, two years of national service in Malaysia, went to England. I could face lots of difficult times, you know. That those days, the difficult to find job because they're foreign doctors, you know, and uh, I managed it, you know. And, and people complained that they they couldn't man can find the jobs and feel of discrimination. To face it, you know. Maybe the next the next question is uh, I think uh, the audience will be very interested. What kind of uh, as a psychiatrist and somebody who treats people for to help them improve their mental health, what daily routines do you have to maintain or even improve your own mental health? Right, right. Yeah. This question we asked many times by my medical students. Yes. Uh, yesterday, by a friend of mine uh, who's a professor here. Yes. Yeah. And uh, he, he he has a bit of depression, but he has recovered. And, and he asked me the same thing that you you look at the people with depression, anxiety, schizophrenia. Uh, how how you? How does the doctor treat himself? Yes. That's right. So well, I, I I told him that my routine is I often get up and I daily I get up at the crack of dawn about five thirty and up at uh, five and and. and or 5.30 and, and uh, having light, very light breakfast or read the papers and after that I will do about 10 minutes of mindfulness practice. You know, I don't call it meditation, mindfulness practice. Um, and then I come to work and run a clinic here at the clinic uh, um, and often during lunch also a very light lunch and meet up with, with, with colleagues uh, to discuss uh, some other research and in the afternoon once again with the research meeting and in the evening when I when I when I go back, uh, spend some time with the family, and uh, something I enjoy every day for the last 40 years is I, I like to cook my own dinner. Oh. So I like curry, you know, to, today my wife has got fish for me. You know, think of the, uh, a, a new concoct, a new uh, spices you know, that we get in the market uh, uh, and try it out there's kind of uh, spice. Or, or if I'm a bit lazy, I'll do my favorite Teochew steam fish, you know. And after that, um, yeah, just, listen yeah. to the news. And um, and uh, I, like, I love music, so uh, sometimes I put on a, a CD. I still use CD, Bjorn. Uh, uh, either it's of something on Rack Maninoff or, or Beethoven, but sometimes you just put on a, a CD by Bob Dylan. The, CD, the, the quality is Dylan. better than what's on Spotify. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, and, and, and before, yeah, then I probably do not. 10, 15 minutes of mindfulness again and give me some time to reflect on today's work. You know. mm. And uh, on, on, for the last uh, six months, we were planning a, a, a book, you know. Uh, so I would spend about half an hour, for 45 minutes, uh, um, editing the book or writing my chapter of the book. You know. yeah. mm. So I find that it's very, very useful. It's about half, half an hour to 45 minutes to write something in your thoughts. You know. Uh, so that's how the day will, will end uh, with the family again, and um, so it's, it's. I try to stretch it out a bit longer if, if possible, and, and, and sometimes on weekends, uh, grandchildren are around. It's wonderful, you know. To make them, uh, and um, but for for people, I come to my clinic. You know, I run a busy clinic also at the Farrer Park Hospital, and um, I find that many people come up bankers, doctors, lawyers, they, they lead very, very busy life. So I told them that you, you spend your time in the gym, you must exercise your muscles, you must also exercise your, your mind. So I told them maybe in the morning, uh, you, you feel very tense, after your breakfast, like me, do 10 minutes of your mindfulness practice. And then in the afternoon after lunch, because you, you go also very long hours, the bankers and the lawyers, you know, 10 minutes. And but before you sleep, half an hour. You know. There's an American friend called Alan Wallace who used the term spice your life. Spice your life with 10 minutes or 5 minutes of mindfulness practice. Or even for some of the, the nurses who come down from Pongo to NUH, I'll tell them maybe you to do um, just about, if you're in the train itself, do about half an hour. You know? you know, Rather than looking around the train, close or your eyes. and in the train, right? Yeah. yeah. It's a good time. So, so that's wonderful. Yeah. So or even a patient of train that a uh, long queue in a in a pharmacy. Well, it's you wait for long queue, close your eyes and do, do your mindfulness practice. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good suggestion. Very good recommendation.
So my next question, one of my second last questions, Prof Kwa, uh, is that the World Health Organization actually highlighted uh, this issue of burnout, specifically work burnout last year in 2019, right? And uh, I don't think anybody saw the pandemic coming in 2020, right? They, last year, the WHO highlighted hospitals or the entire healthcare sector as highly susceptible to workplace burnout. But you know, this year, the pandemic has put the hospitals under even uh, you know, a bigger spotlight. So I'm sure the burnout situation is worse. Coming from this cauldron of uh, workplace stress, Prof Kwa, what kind of advice would you have for the workplaces of today in this post-pandemic world, in-pandemic world? What kind, of, uh, what kind of messages would you want to send to the business leaders who are looking for solutions, strategies, and, uh, you know, and what kind of advice or, or key policies would you have for them? I think this is a very pertinent question at this time of the pandemic. Um, mm. Some years ago, I was helping the World Health in terms of education and try to convey a message um, that there is, there can be no health without mental health. And to, to help the, the World Health to redefine the definition of health, not just the absence of physical illness, but indeed mental health to function in our hospitals, in clinics, in the, in the uh, banks, in your workplace. So you also need mental health to enjoy your life. If people with depression, they, they can't enjoy the good food, you know, yeah. relationship. So now in the midst of the pandemic, uh, um, I learned a word from a, a friend in the World Health. He said, this, besides the, um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, there's also a pandemic of fear. Yeah. So if you have two pandemics running together, pari parsu, it's called a syndemic. All these are, um, are made worse by all kind of rumors spreading around. Mm. So um, I gave a talk to, to, the, to the doctors on the seven habits uh, of of to combat uh, the COVID anxiety. You know? So the first thing is to get the right information. You know? Because sometimes people, especially in you know, a lockdown, they sit in the, in the house, they listen to all kinds of news you know, from their friends, they send them WhatsApp and all that. You know? and, and, and they have news, they listen to BBC, they listen to CNN, CNA, everything. You know? So I tell you, you know, you'll be inundated with all kinds of and all the bad news about more yeah. and more kids coming up. More bad news. So I told them that yes, if you can, if you can, just maybe twice, twice a day. Listen, I listen morning news and evening news, just enough, and get on the right source. And I, th I think Singapore is very fortunate. I said listen to the, the the source from the Ministry of Health. I think the source, you know, right? Secondly, you got to acknowledge they're going to be stressed. It's very important. The, the the normal routine is disrupted now. You know? You, 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 you cannot say, I want to get back my way of doing things. You cannot. You, the, the, our routine, you have to put on a mask if you have to go out. So, show, so, social distancing, you have to practice it. Now. So the whole thing has changed now. The third thing important to remember is carry on your exercise. You know? Doesn't it mean that you must go to work, run in a stadium? Even within your own house, can do exercise. You know? right. uh, uh, static exercise. You know? And fourth is your diet. You know? Some people, uh, and at this time, complain of insomnia. You know, the, uh, the prescription for sleeping pills has gone up. You know, but I tell people that that is important. You, you should cut down your caffeine and your your the coffee and the tea for a while. You know, this morning I saw another student, same thing, complaining insomnia on the sleeping pill, but drinking a lot of coffee to keep himself awake so they can study at night. That's not the right, right thing to do. Another group of people that I see are people who you know, drink too much now. They cannot sleep. They drink a lot of alcohol. Now they have more problems. So diet very, very important. So the, the, the fifth thing, very important, is spend some time doing mindfulness practice. Mm -hmm. So once again, 10 minutes in the morning and the, the afternoon and 30 minutes before you sleep. I think that's a good pattern. You know? Some people will complain that oh, I have no time to 10 minutes. Then do five minutes so that you... So that you Built into your routine every day. Then the, the sixth thing is the, the sixth uh, habit is make sure you have other other activities, other recreation. You know, not just studying all the time, as I tell the students, or or working, or you're doctoring all the time. Something like ah, listen to uh, or do some art, or listen to music. You know, 
You've done the research that even gardening helps to improve your immune system. You know, and it's interesting because it was published in the World's Journal, and last month I was asked, uh, interviewed by the BBC. You know, that gardening is good for the immune system. So there are other activities in, in your life. You know. And finally, I tell people that you know, the, the seventh thing is to build a social capital. You know, the people whom you can rely on to help out. And it's very crucial now in, at, at, at the time of pandemic that a lot of people, old people, uh, uh, widows and widowers living alone, you know, and uh, they cannot get out, they're afraid to get out. You know. So if you have a neighbor who is a widow, widower, sometime before you go do your shopping, ask them, can I buy something for you? Or I know some people who are, who are frightened to come to the hospital. So they ask the neighbors, you're going to NUH or some, can you get the, my medication for me? I think, I think um, helping out people, a sense of altruism, you know, you, you give something to people, it, it, it derives sort of, of satisfaction to you. So this kind of uh, compassion is very, very important for your mental health also that we are giving something. So once again, the seven habits, firstly, is to acknowledge the stress. Second, also to get information. Third, exercise. Fifth, a diet. Fifth, mindfulness. Don't forget the recreation. And finally, the social capital. And I tell people all these seven habits that you think about it, and you find that you can cope with it better. The seven habits of uh, surviving this pandemic. Thank you so much, Okwa. I think we learned a lot today from uh, someone who is an undisputed mastermind, and uh, you spend a lot of time fighting several wars. I would say, you know, like uh, most importantly, I think this stigma. Right, the war and the stigma of uh, mental illnesses, I think, in uh, Asia, right? Especially a lot of time in Singapore. So, the, the, uh, you are, so do you have any final messages? You know, I've run out of questions. Do you have any yes. final messages? The final message is that I think most important is, as you mentioned, beyond is to, for people who, are, who want to build up, enhance their mental resilience, so you see, the, the, the success of Singapore is because of mental health. You know, you know um, the success of Singapore is because of creativity and mental resilience. So in 1965, when this place was built, or started off in the New Republic, you know, they got their new ideas. And they got to right through a lot of stormy periods. You know, like even if right, right into the pandemic now, you know, got the uh, mental resilience. So mental resilience and creativity, the bedrock is mental health. So in mental health, very important. But people are often afraid of stigma. I must uh, mention that in this kind of campaign, it's not just the doctors. We, we, require, we need people in the community to come out. And one of the, 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 the strong supporters is our friend, Professor Tommy Cole. He put it in his Facebook, a, a book I wrote called Speaking Up for Mental Illness. And he told people, read this book. And everybody, been, and the sale has gone up. The way it's good for me, uh, but also people read and say, "Hey, there are a lot of good things in, in that you can recover from mental illness, and you can also prevent. Most important, prevent uh, a mental illness." Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Kwa. Thank you for joining our show. Yeah, and I wish you all the best in continuing the fight on the war on stigma, and we'll be a part of it. Thank you for giving us the opportunity. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Bjorn. Bye bye. Prof. Kwa. Thank you.